The Emancipation Proclamation was issued by the United States President Abraham Lincoln on January 1, 1863, during the American Civil War under his war powers. But what did this and what does this mean? How did it come about and does it mean we are free? In the 1850s, the northern and the southern states could not agree on the power of slaveholders to control the national government. In other words, the south wanted to keep Hebrew slaves while the north had no need of them. So they say. And they fought each other as we were taught in last month's lesson on the Civil War. During Abraham Lincoln's presidency of the 1860s, slave states, the states of the south, left the Union. Or in other words, they left the United States and formed the Confederate States of America. So imagine all the southern states at the bottom of your screen packing up and leaving the northern states. Now you just have half of the United States. This is important to know, little Hebrews, because it is what Abraham Lincoln fought for, to keep the United States, not to free Hebrews. In Rudolf R. Winsor's The Valley of Dry Bones, he states, during the period between 1790 and 1860, the Democrats controlled the federal government for 50 years out of 70. During this period, the Democratic Party was the party of the slaveholders. Abraham Lincoln's Republican Party freed, quote-unquote, the slaves and began to give them civil rights. Perhaps it is more proper to say that the blacks freed themselves. As president, it was Lincoln's job to lead the Union and to preserve it, or to lead the United States and to make sure it continued to exist. Therefore, to save it, in 1865, Abraham Lincoln outlawed chattel slavery. In other words, he made it illegal. Now, little Hebrews, Lincoln wasn't against slavery. He was so for it. Lincoln himself had over 300 slaves, according to the Walter Johnson's Soul by Soul, Life Inside the Antebellum Slave Market. So with slaves of his own, Lincoln clearly wasn't in favor of their whereabouts. And in a letter to Horace Grizzly, editor of the New York Tribune at that time, he stated, and I quote, My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union." End quote. According to the encyclopedia, emancipation is a term referring to giving rights and equality to a group of people. But it also stems from ex manus capire, take out the hand. This is interesting because there was a cartoon ad criticizing Lincoln because they say freeing, quote unquote, the slaves was the last card in his hand that could save the Union. He had taken out his hand, that is, he was desperate to save the United States. While the Civil War began as a war to restore the Union, not to end slavery, by 1862, under his authority as the Commander-in-Chief, President Lincoln announced the emancipation or freeing of the enslaved African Americans living in the states of the Confederacy which were in rebellion. But did the emancipation free us? The Emancipation Proclamation did not free a single slave, both spiritually and physically. And Yah shall bring you back to Egypt in ships, by a way of which I said to you, you are never to see it again, and there you shall be sold to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one to buy. To buy is to redeem, or to save. Yah is telling us that no man, Gentile or Hebrew, light hue or dark hue, will save us from our current situations. But what will? And it shall be, if you diligently obey the voice of Yah, your mighty one, to God to do all his commands which I command you today, that Yah, your mighty one, 
shall set you high above all nations of the earth. Deuteronomy 28.1 Only Yah, our Creator, who put us on this punishment, can free us from it. As Lincoln had hoped, the proclamation made other countries favor the Union by adding the ending of slavery as a goal of the war. The proclamation also ensured they would not block Lincoln's renomination of 1864, and it didn't. When President Lincoln ran for a second term, the Republican Party chose Andrew Johnson as Lincoln's vice president. Lincoln and Johnson won the election on the Republican ticket. Remember, little Hebrews, Republicans were against slavery, but Johnson wasn't a Republican. He was a Democrat, so he was for slavery. So now you may ask, how does a Republican have a Democrat for a partner? Because they are on the same team, little Hebrews. They have the same wicked goals. Continuing on, Johnson never became a Republican like his friend Lincoln. And when Lincoln was assassinated April 15, 1865, Johnson became the complete Democrat he wanted to be anyway. This same year, chattel slavery was abolished, but mental slavery began. On May 29, 1865, after Lincoln's death, Andrew Johnson would become president. When he did, he put into place another proclamation called the Amnesty Proclamation that reversed what the so-called Emancipation Proclamation put in place. The Emancipation Proclamation supposedly punished the South by abolishing slavery, but the Amnesty Proclamation offered forgiveness by excusing slaveholders and giving their rights back and their property. The term 40 acres and a mule was anything but funny to the slaves, because as free men, it was what they were promised. But the land was given back to the slave masters instead of the Hebrews. The Hebrews never got it. Remember, Lincoln and Johnson was buddies, so to think that Lincoln had no knowledge of this plan before he died would be ludicrous. In short, Hebrews were free from the plantations, but they had no food, no homes, no livestock, and medical care. They were as stranded as a stray dog. Again, Rudolf Wenzel breaks down to us what this proclamation did. In retrospect, it is obvious that Johnson and his supporters intended to reduce the black man to a status of semi-slavery, which became known later as sharecropping. Johnson sought to keep the black man in a state of semi-slavery by returning the big plantations to the planters instead of dividing up the plantations and distributing them back to the black man, 40 acres and a mule. This dire situation kept the black man destitute, landless, weak, with no place to go but to remain on the plantations, living under the hostile yoke of the same slave masters to be exploited to the highest degree. After Andrew Johnson established all white state governments in the South, although four million blacks lived in these states, the white southerners enacted black codes. Because of the stringency of these laws, many northerners believed that their aims were to keep the black man in a status of involuntary servitude, if not actual slavery. Blacks could not serve on juries. They were denied the choice of approaching whites unmasked, and they could not own land. Any white man, rich or poor, could also arrest a black man. Severe work rules were enacted. Black laborers became known as servants, irrespective of sex or whether they worked indoors or outside. And the employers were known as masters. In the spring or summer, they worked 12 to 16 hours a day.